Hello, everyone. Hope you all are enjoying the day two of the India Business Conference. For our next session, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. He is the principal economic advisor to the government of India. A globally acclaimed economist, he spent two decades in the financial sector and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank till 2015. He was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic, Economic Forum in 2010. A trained economist, he has published around 200 articles, columns, reports in leading international publications. He was also a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford. He's a historian, an urban theorist, and authored several books. It's an honor again on behalf of the Columbia Business School to welcome Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. Pleasure to be here. This session will be moderated by Professor Nandini Gupta, uh, an associate professor of finance at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. Her research focuses on the political economy of finance, financial development, labor, and emerging markets. She's also an associate editor at the Review of Finance Journal and also part of Columbia University's Deepak and Neera Raj Center of Indian Economic Policies. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Professor Gupta. Now over to you, Mr. Sanya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so how would you like to proceed on this? Uh, uh, I'll let, uh, uh, let you decide. Do you want me to speak for a little while and then want to go into Q&A? Is that how you would like to do this? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, friends, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, uh, opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, and a uh, very good uh, morning. I assume it's still morning there. Um, <clears throat> as you may be aware, um, the last one year um, has been obviously very difficult for everybody on the planet. Uh, and um, it, uh, it, it, it brought a lot of uh, difficulties in terms of policy making here in India, as you can imagine. So what I'm going to do rather than to list out uh, gazillion policies that we have uh, announced over the years or even more recently in the uh, annual budget, uh, all of which you can easily read up in the newspapers or, in, uh, uh, or on <clears throat> various other social media and other channels. Uh, what I think I'll do is give you a, a, a feel of the way decisions are made um, under these kinds of uh, difficult circumstances so that uh, you know uh, how and when uh, certain decisions were made, what was the thinking process. I think that you may find interesting, um, particularly because, um, you know, through the course of your lives, wherever you go, whether it's in business or public policy or elsewhere, uh, you know, you will find yourself in um, uh, very uncertain circumstances. And what I hope to do is to provide you a sense of how decisions uh, can be taken under those very difficult situations. So I think that might be something you might find more interesting than a long list of policies. So um, let me take you back to um, um, last March when this whole thing bubbled up um, around the world. At that point in time, if you remember, the only real information anybody had, uh, policymakers, um, or international organizations or pretty much anyone, was that something um, had happened in China. It was not very clear what had exactly happened in China, uh, but it had clearly been serious enough to shut down um, a very large city and all surrounding areas and several other cities as well. Um, and then whatever it was had spread to Northern Italy and was killing a lot of people and then seemed to be then spreading into uh, other countries as well. So that was what was going on. And like many other countries, uh, we uh, consulted all the experts uh, in epidemics and viral, uh, uh, virology and so on. And um, we listened to what they had to say. Uh, we discovered very quickly that there was a very wide range of uh, uh, possible outcomes. Uh, you had on one hand, uh, um, some who argued that this was nothing much more than a bad flu. Um, and then there were others who argued that there will literally be 300 million people infected in India by July and two or three million people dead. 
uh, and you know es and still escalating beyond that so you can imagine that this was a very wide range of uh, uh, possible outcomes and different countries uh, policy makers took a different call so basically you know you would have heard of the swedish model you would have heard of the british originally opting for herd immunity then changing their mind singapore opted for something and then changed their mind as well and so on they basically people were trying to guess which of these options was the most likely and then try and uh, go down that path now here in india we had a uh, we knew that we had an additional problem which was that whatever path we took with 1.35 billion people once we went down that path we were stuck with it it's very difficult to change path so what do we do so we thought about it and we realized one important insight from all of this which was that no matter what the various experts said we clearly could see that essentially nobody knew what was going to happen that is the main thing we understood from the wide range of um outcomes possible so what do you, how do you take decisions in a situation of radical uncertainty when no one really knows what's going to happen so we opted for something that is very often used in financial markets for dealing with radical uncertainty so those of you who uh, have something to do with financial markets may have heard of something called a barbell strategy so what do you do in a barbell strategy uh, in barbell strategy basically you take two opposite um, strategies and you combine them so here what we did is that we took first of all we decided one side of the barbell was that we were going to hedge for the very worst i mean just turn, if it just turned out to be there is going to kill millions of people well we sh should try and hedge as best as we could against the worst outcome now that was the context in which we went for the for the tight um lockdown we we went for a, a strong lockdown right in the beginning and you will remember it was perhaps the tightest lockdown anywhere in the world and the other side we what we did is we began to uh respond um with a bayesian updating of information so on one side a lockdown which gives us of course time to gather more information um create some testing capacity quarantining capacity and so on and meanwhile gather information and as you do a bayesian updating of information you can then step by step proceed forward so this is precisely how we have gone about it it has worked very well on the medical front and since september our numbers have come down very 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 sharply as you may be aware we now have about uh, 10000 uh, cases daily and about 100 deaths daily from covid and uh, these are well within tolerable limits and uh, these are still falling and of course we are now rolling out uh, the world's largest um vaccine program so uh, that is what is we did on the uh, on the health front now we did pretty much exactly the same thing we used a barbell strategy on the economic front as well so when we did a lockdown um as you can imagine we knew economic activity by definition would stall uh, that's precisely what happened uh, but it came as no surprise to us now at that time many people were advising us that we should come up with one grand stimulus package to try and reinflate the economy now that was the that's what many other uh, many other countries as did as well but we again opted for a somewhat different strategy our our thinking was that while you are under lockdown there's no point in trying to revive the demand because the supply side was had been shut down we had ourselves shut it down it it would have been the equivalent of pressing on the accelerator with your foot firmly on the brake complete waste of resources so what did we do what we did is we decided to use the the available resources for essentially providing a safety net um to both the vulnerable sections of uh, society and of the business community so what we did during that lockdown period april may june and so on we rolled out the world's largest food program 800 million people were provided essentially free food then we transferred some amount of money to the very poorest through something called the jandhan account similarly for the business sector for the uh, msmes there was a 100% guarantee for loans 
Um, the insolvency and bankruptcy code was held in abeyance so that there would be no cascade of defaults ripping through the, uh, through the economic system and so on and so forth. Now, it was no one's contention that we were at that stage trying to revive the economy as such. We were providing a safety net. And then what we did, just, what, just like with the, um, uh, the health response, we did a step-by-step Bayesian updating and responding to the situation as it evolved. And so what we did rather than have these grand um, stimulus packages, which we thought would be not very successful, uh, we began to do a series of medium sized packages. And then by about September, as the infection rates peaked, we then began to think about ramping up the economy. So that is the stage in October that we began to press the accelerator. So in October, government's capital expenditure suddenly spiked up by 129% year on year. The following month, it's went up 249% year on year. Then in December, it went up 62%. And January number isn't out, but it will also be significantly up. Now, the, the combination of this, uh, this ramp up in capital spending, combined with pent up demand that had uh, uh, for consumers that had been pent up during the lockdown period, has meant that we have seen a very strong V-shaped recovery in economic growth. And as we stand here in January, we have already seen many, many um, sectors uh, come back to pre-COVID levels, even higher than pre-COVID levels. So for example, car sales are up 16% year on year in January. Uh, electricity um, consumption has now, uh, you know, not only is it up vis-a-vis uh, -vis January 2020, it is at all time highs and so on and so forth. Now, that doesn't mean everything is back to normal. There are sectors that we continue to hold down for health reasons, um, travel and tourism being one, um, entertainment being another one. In every place, we are opening them up gingerly. But the good news is wherever we're opening them up, demand seems to come back reasonably quickly. Nevertheless, we do recognize that this requires continued stimulus over a period of time. Um, and um, so um, just earlier this week, we announced a budget. And in there, we announced a program of a large scale infrastructure spending over the next three years. So there will be a very large scale uh, expansion in the fiscal deficit, of course, over, the, over this financial year, which will end on 31st of March, 9.5% um, of GDP in the deficit. Now that deficit is partly due to greater spending, but also because um, both the uh, denominator shrunk because GDP growth will shrink during this financial year by about 7 cent or odd. And partly because revenues also shrunk at the same time. So there will be a very sizable uh, deficit of 9.5% of GDP, which I think is now par for the course. In uh, normal years, a lot of people would raise uh, red flags over it, but I think that's par for the course. But even next year, in the next financial year, while we will bring it down significantly, we are aiming at about 68 and then slowly over the next two or three years, we'll bring it down to four or, or, or even less percent of GDP. But notice here that our strategy is quite different again from many other countries. We are trying to reinflate demand using capital expenditure, particularly on infrastructure, but more widely on infrastructure defined more widely, so health and so on. Now, why are we doing this as opposed to say, sending out COVID checks to people? The reason for that is simple. One, we will be running up some debts while doing this. We want to leave future generations with assets to match those debts. So we want to build up assets and particularly in a country like India, which is uh, you know, starved of uh, um, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure in many sectors. We want to build up those infrastructure. So we will use this to ramp up uh, infrastructure spending and leave those assets behind to match the liabilities. The second reason is this, uh, our experience is that this is the fastest way to create multipliers um, in terms of creating jobs, demand for various items and so on. So that's another reason why we want to do this. So, and, and we have already been doing this for some time since October, as I mentioned. So that has meant that, you know, there is already a sort of momentum in the spending that's coming through. So 
Looking at that with a shrinkage of 7% in this financial year, we expect GDP growth in next year as per what we published in the economic survey just, uh, just a week ago uh, by about 11% in real terms and 15.5% uh, in nominal terms in terms of GDP growth next year. Uh, the IMF is somewhat more optimistic. They think it'll be 11.5% GDP growth rate. But um, my sense is that um, these are still conservative numbers. Um, we will do much better than that. In fact, the, fisc the, 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 the uh, budget numbering is even more conservative, 10% uh, GDP growth rate, but uh, I'm quite certain we'll do better than that. I, I, as I said, I think we'll do better than even the forecasts uh, I typed out in the economic survey just a week ago. So <clears throat> uh, what you will see here is very strong growth coming back, almost certainly the fastest recovery of any country in the world. Um, and um, uh, combining that with yet another thing that is quite unique to the Indian response to the COVID uh, crisis, which is almost uniquely, uh, India went in for large scale um, uh, supply side reforms uh, during this entire period. Now, <clears throat> this is quite different because remember, Virtually every other country has basically gone for demand reflation. We have gone for a much more supply side approach. So through the course of the, um, uh, the lockdown and even subsequently, we have opened up many sectors. Um, we removed, for example, onerous uh, regulations uh, or related to telecom uh, on the BPO and IT sector. So, you know, the, the back office outsourcing business is a big business in India. And it will have these outdated rules and regulations uh, on it, and we have scrapped them. Uh, we have changed some 40 odd central uh, labor laws and replaced them with modern, four modern codes, uh, labor laws. Um, uh, something we had been trying to do for decades, but it's now done. We have dramatically changed um, um, uh, the way, for example, um, autonomous bodies are, um, uh, uh, are managed and large numbers of them are now being closed if they are found to be outdated or outmoded. Um, and so that's a big administrative reform that is uh, ongoing. And of course, we, we also did uh, very uh, 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 farm uh, law changes. Um, there's, of course, political wrangling, uh, perhaps not unexpected over it, but these are um, reforms that have been debated for decades. Virtually every economist worth their salt has written saying that this is absolutely necessary and we have done them. Now, there may be some tweaking necessary, but by and large, the broad theme of these reforms will be maintained because they are necessary for India's future and particularly for the future of the farm sector because farmers need to be given greater autonomy in their lives and the way they sell their produce. So this is something, as I said, had been debated for decades. Pretty much every economist agrees it's a good thing. The vast majority of farmers also agree what it's a good thing. But nevertheless, if there are some issues, they too will be sorted out. Now you can see what is going on here. We are opting for growth unabashedly. And in the, in the um, budget uh, uh, earlier this week, some more supply side measures were being pushed through. Uh, one of them, of course, is a very clear and unapologetic push for privatization. Now, we this is a government that has been pushing for privatization for some time. Unfortunately, this one gone year gone past, we were not able to push uh, through privatization because of various disruptions in the financial markets. But um, we are quite confident that we will be able to push through quite a lot this year. Um, I think Air India, all the background paperwork is done. And I think we should see that quickly enough. And we will do more. And as I said, we are unapologetic about doing privatization. This word disinvestment, which somehow sounded like we were not quite privatizing things. Well, we have gotten rid of that. We use the word privatization and, and, and that's that. Um, <clears throat> looking ahead, let me say uh, that the post-COVID world is not a reinflation of the pre-COVID world. That is something that is a guiding principle in all the reforms we have done. This is why we have stressed on doing these supply side reforms because we need to be prepared for a world that will be quite different into which we emerge. Its geopolitics will be different. 
It's um, um, supply chains will be different. It's um, technologies will be different. Consumer behavior will be different. So we need to invest into flexibility as being a key guiding principle of what we do into, the, into this new world. Another guiding principle, which a word that you will hear quite often in our documents is the word Atmanirbhar. Let me explain that because very often this word is translated and thought of being some sort of a return to self-reliance of the 1950s and protectionism and so on. That is totally not the case as the prime minister and the finance minister and many other members of the government have clarified over and over again. We have no intentions of going back and driving in ambassadors again ever. India intends to participate in global supply chains. The point about Atmanirbhata is to simply take a non-ideological view about resilience of our economic system and to encourage certain kinds of clustering of activities in India. So let me give you an example so that you understand what I mean. India, as you well know, is the world's pharmacy. It has a very large globally competitive pharmaceutical sector. But one of the things we realized very early in this uh, COVID crisis was the extent to which um, our pharmaceutical sector was vulnerable to single source um, inputs. And that you can have the best pharmaceutical sector in the world, but it can suddenly stall because a single source uh, suddenly stalls on you. And this is, we discovered, quite a dangerous thing because it fundamentally uh, undermines our resilience. So we will provide support to, for certain kinds of clusters, in, particularly for inputs that go into what we have identified as crucial sectors. And we will then protect them in various ways or encourage them in various ways. This is not a case of protectionism. This is simply being practical about providing resilience to a globally competitive sector. This is totally not inward looking and it is certainly not a return to the 1950s. Um, the same kind of thinking is true as far as uh, the fact our unwillingness to have joined the RCEP trade deal. Uh, that's not because we are ideologically opposed to trade deals. We're quite happy to, to, to sign up to other trade deals, but this particular trade deal did not work for us. And so we didn't sign it. We, as I said, we don't have an ideological affinity to signing trade deals just because it says so in the trade, uh, in, the, in the textbooks. We will do it according to what we gauge at, at that point in time to be the sensible um, approach. And if there is another trade deal that comes along and it turns out that we, it seems to be something that we can um, work with, we will sign them. Um, and of course, we remain very open to um, foreign investment. Uh, we have just opened up the insurance sector just uh, five days ago um, and uh, to foreign investment and, and in foreign inflows, both of portfolio inflows and of FDI is now at record highs, as you also probably already know. So we remain open for business and, um, um, you know, and we will hopefully be able to um, come out of this COVID crisis uh, stronger than before. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll hand it over back to the host uh, and we can have a Q&A or whatever else uh, is in store. Right, I, I, I guess that's my cue. Can yep. uh, people hear me? <laughs> okay, yeah, I was having yeah, some trouble. Um, so it's great to be here today, and uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Shannal, for that wonderful summary of uh, of what uh, your vision is for India's growth prospects in this uh, hopefully soon to be post COVID world. Let me ask you a couple of questions about the budget, if that's okay, and after no. that. I will switch over to the Q&A from the audience. First of all, uh, you touched upon privatization and um, the government has announced 
an ambitious privatization goal. And as you also mentioned, it's been one of those reforms that um, shall not be named, <laughs> um, used to be referred to as disinvestment in all previous years. So uh, just to catch the audience up, uh, the finance minister said that the government will privatize all PSUs except those in the strategic sectors of defense, transport, energy, and finance. Um, I was wondering if we could take a step back and for the audience's sake, if you could tell us a little bit uh, about what you think are the benefits of privatization and how the Indian government thinks this will help spur economic growth. Well, I mean, this is a long debate that's gone on in India, again, for decades. There are clearly large numbers of uh, public sector units that have either outlived their utility or are certainly um, inefficient compared to uh, their peers. Um, many of them are loss-making uh, and have taken large losses, but they very often squat uh, on um, valuable assets like real estate or even state monopolies of various kinds. So I think there is a case for simply monetizing them, not merely in terms of raising resources for the government, which is of course always helpful, but simply <clears throat> um, creating and opening up, uh, and, you know, leveraging these assets for the economy more widely. After all, <clears throat> why squat on um, these assets and when they can be much more valuably used in the rest of the economy by the private sector, which can then, you know, make money and pay us taxes instead of being in a position where we have to keep subsidizing them with valuable taxpayers' money. So that is the overall thinking. Um, now, uh, as I said, um, it, the, 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 the point about privatization is not merely about public sector companies. If you listened carefully, you'll see the finance minister mentioned clearly monetization. And so this will include large chunks of land, that uh, or, or other kinds of assets that happen to be lying around in the government's asset book, but are not leveraged. For example, um, many Indian cities have huge chunks of derelict land lying around in the middle of them. Um, there's a city of Kanpur, which is a sizable city. There are literally square kilometers of land in the middle of them from old cotton mills, which you know went, uh, went bust years and years ago. And they need to be redeveloped. After all, all great cities do that. Um, this, uh, the same is true of Mumbai, the entire Eastern seaboard. Um, there's 1,800 acres of land, most, some of the most valuable land in Asia, which is lying derelict and can be redeveloped. It's all sea facing land. Um, similarly, uh, Delhi has land in and around uh, what is called the Indra, Indraprastha area. Um, Kolkata has a uh, you know, miles of derelict uh, warehouses and so on along the Hooghly River. So the point is that there is lots of assets there. Many of these assets should be, should be leveraged and monetized because obviously the government needs resources, but also because when you redeploy these resources, they actually generate value. For example, these land, uh, no, just imagine you can literally build new skylines for some of these major cities and other countries and other cities have done so. I mean, London has been rebuilt entirely by, you know, the Canary Wharf and, and, and so on on the Eastern front. Um, you know, new York has gone through many uh, rounds of rebuilding. Um, I mean, just the redeployment, for example, of the meat pack, meat packing district, uh, which not so long ago was, uh, you know, a, a, a literal meat packing district. It was redeployed and it's valuable to the city to do that. So the point I'm making is that um, this privatization, monetization thinking is not just about selling something, quickly take some money, and it's, it's, it's much, much more thoughtful than that. I, um, I would agree because uh, much of my research is on privatization. Um, but I think one of the things that uh, perhaps I can push you a little bit further on is the idea of keeping um, some of these companies as going concerns and whether or not privatization and in particular um, the, the transfer of management control to the private sector, other than deploying or redeploying, as you point out, real estate that has not been 
used effectively. Do you think transferring control to private owners will improve the efficiency of these companies and perhaps help to keep some of them as going concerns? And the reason I mention this is um, because I wonder whether this can be used to push back against some of the opposition to privatization in India. Well, I mean, it, that depends on the new owners and what the deal is struck in each particular case. Um, it's, by the way, in some of these private, uh, these public sector companies have good human capital, oddly enough, and some uh, and it's experienced uh, uh, human capital, um, and you need them. I mean, if Air India, for example, is so low, you still need pilots. And um, the problem has never been with Air India's pilots. Um, and they are qualified. They clearly, uh, you know, got a reasonably good record. So I don't think the problem is with the, the you, you'll need to retain a lot of the people in some cases because they add value. But then it is up to the new owners to decide what is valuable and what is not. Uh, and so, yes, I mean, it, that, that depends obviously on the, particular, uh, the particulars of the case. Uh, I, I can't do a broad brush, um, you know, Sure. Okay. Let's um, uh, let's move on to some of the other things you uh, talked about in your introduction. So um, there's been a lot of exciting reforms also announced uh, for the banking sector, and uh, in particular. Professor uh, Panagaria had a recent column out uh, with Rajiv Mantri in the Times of India, uh, which discusses the importance of bank credit in India. So other than privatization, what can you tell us about the government's vision for expanding domestic credit in India to the private sector? Well, there is no doubt that um, we need to expand India's banking system. There is no question about that. Uh, India is a peculiar country where it has a fairly uh, robust uh, capital markets, particularly for the equities uh, share market. Uh, but on the other hand, the banking system is, uh, is a midget compared to what it should be. Um, you know, the, the banking system as a proportion of GDP is the lowest of any major, uh, major economy in the world. So it is quite obvious that you can't develop the whole a sort of ecosystem of financing with just the stock market and equity financing. You need the whole gamut of uh, financing and banks have to be a part of that. And so they have to grow dramatically from where they are. Unfortunately, previous periods of high growth have always ended badly. So this is the problem. So if you, if you force it to grow yeah. and, and it happens. It's just like rush hour. Right, like more people are showing up. I think there is and there can be a total reshuffling. I think there's some, of, you know, who's highest among the who's lowest, um, things like that. There we go. Okay, please continue. Okay, so, uh, so it's very clear that bank Indian banking system needs to grow very dramatically. Now, many things have been changed along the way. They are much better supervised and regulated today than they were even five or six years ago. And a lot of cleaning up has been done. Um, there are parts of the banking system. I mean, I was quite shocked to find out a few years ago that there were actually uh, things called banks in India, which the Reserve Bank of India did not actually supervise properly anyway, like the cooperative banks. And there were all kinds of uh, opaque uh, practices. Many of them have been sorted out. Uh, similarly, we didn't have a proper bankruptcy system. So that has now put in, been put in place. Uh, they've been held in abeyance right now, but the process has been in place and very large cases have been settled using the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So again, we have now doing well on that front. So there's a system of liquefying them. So now comes the, so now that we have all these things in place, we are much more confident about, again, pressing the accelerator on these and expanding them. But the question is, how do you do it? Do we want the public sector to go out and do it? Well, there are actually some public sector banks that are pretty good. And I can name State Bank of India as being pretty well run by any global standard, including private bank standards. But many of the others are weak. But clearly, we cannot have a system where the public sector is 70% of the banking system, which is the case in India. So the private sector clearly has to grow. 
Now, the private sector itself has had all kinds of problems of its own. And so hopefully with better supervision and more transparency, they will be better run now. Um, but then we need it to expand. Some part of it may be, you know, IDBI bank or something may get privatized. But ultimately, the banking system itself has to grow. More, the, the private sector has to grow. And by the way, it'll be growing against the state where some part of public sector will also be growing. And I said, some of it is good. So, <laughs> if, the, so if that balance is to even out, this 30% has to grow a lot faster than that 70%. Um, and so that is how it will be. That is the context, by the way, in which Professor Panagaria and Raji Mantri talked to gave their, uh, their uh, sort of uh, suggestions, including one which is quite controversial, uh, which is to allow uh, corporates to enter this. I, have, I am ambivalent about that idea for the simplest reason. There are clearly conflict of interest uh, issues related to that. But nevertheless, um, the larger point is that you do need more private sector uh, participation in our banking system. They will be a very important part of the post-COVID expansion of the banking system. And more players are needed. Uh, and the existing banks, uh, private sector banks, having been somewhat cleaned up, hopefully will also expand faster. So that's uh, where we are at. Thank you. Um, I think at this moment, I uh, will switch over to some of the audience questions, if that's OK. Um, let's see. One of them, I think, was an interesting one and was also lined, with one, uh, lined up with one of my questions, which is that the budget mentions um, you know, reforms that are specifically targeted to um, increasing the ease of doing business. And, um, and, and you actually mentioned uh, several of the measures in your talk earlier. Um, are any of these specifically targeted towards manufacturing? Well, yes. Um, and these are not just the ones that just got uh, announced. Uh, we actually announced during the course of the COVID lockdown um, a series of programs called the PLI schemes, production linked incentives, which are targeted specifically at manufacturing and manufacturing for exports. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea is the following. You see, India is um, uh, a large market in itself. It wasn't until very recently. It's a large country, but it was actually scattered into several me uh, small and medium sized markets because it, it, it didn't have uh, 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 a unified tax system. So till just a few years ago, till 2017, in fact, it was easier to move for Mumbai to trade with Shanghai than for Mumbai to trade with Delhi because they had such complicated tax differences. That has been sorted uh, through the introduction of the GST. Now, there, some, there were some teething problems in that for the first couple of years, but those have been sorted out. I think any fair observer will agree that the current GST system is uh, a dramatic improvement on whatever was there before, and that it has converted India into a large domestic market. Now, why is that important? Because it now allows us to leverage this scale to be able to create large clusters. And the PLI scheme is aimed precisely at that, that you create these clusters, yes, take advantage of our domestic market, and then you also participate in global supply chains. And so, you know, so again, as I said, certain sectors have been targeted for this. And of course, some, and then of course, the state governments themselves, some of them have been quite proactive in going out there and pitching for business. And we are seeing large scale FDI coming in. In fact, we had record FDI through the lockdown period. People may not believe this, but that is true. And has that FDI been in manufacturing? Yes, a lot of it is, in fact, coming into manufacturing and more will because some big deals have been recently struck with Taiwanese chip makers and, and Apple is doing something and some of the big companies are coming in. Um, same thing is happening with automobiles and many other sectors. And where, presumably, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, so presumably, many, many. Yeah, sorry, you were saying something. Presumably, the infrastructure um, investments are also going to assist with the uh, manufacturing sector scale? Yes, of course. So that is the other thing. So, you know, we do have a very strongly supply side worldview, as you may have gathered from this. Um, and so even when you look, think about um, the demand reflation, 
uh, notice that we did it through infrastructure creation. Uh, infrastructure, while it is being built, is demand side. But once constructed, it is the supply side. So that is, you can see why we have a clear um, tilt in the way we think about the world and our strategy is very targeted. It's not a, we'll try everything and hope something works. That is not what we're doing. We are very clear about how we want to go about it. Right, so let me um, ask a pretty specific question about taxation that's come from the audience. Uh, to build off your earlier uh, mention of it. An amendment to the taxation law initiated by the previous administration in India broke a long-standing tradition of avoiding retrospective application of laws in common law countries. What is the current administration's view on the use of such laws? If different, are there any plans to regain the trust of foreign and domestic investors? There's a lot of parts to this question, but uh, feel free to take any part of it. No, to answer your question clearly and unequivocally, it's a bad idea. And the former finance minister, Arun Jaitley, had promised on the floor of the parliament that this would never again happen. So it was a bad idea, it should never be done. And it's, but we did inherit a some cases which the previous government had done using a retrospective tax system. Uh, we have allowed those cases to run their course because they were already in place. Um, because in fact, in some ways, ironically, if we had unmounted, that would also be a retrospective action. So we have let that run its course and they have now come to the end of that process and some decision with political decision will be taken and that will be the end of that. But let me assure you, we will never again do retrospective taxes. It was a bad idea and there is no other justification for it. Um, thank you for that. So a question, circling back to the financial sector for a moment, a question I um, that people have about um, the banking sector in the present moment is um, this idea of creating a bad bank to consolidate the NPAs. What is, could you perhaps expand for the audience what the government has in mind for this particular step? So the details of this particular step are not yet out. So it's the prerogative of the finance minister to announce them. But um, broadly, let me say that uh, this is not quite a bad bank. Um, it is an asset management and reconstruction company which the banks themselves will run. It is more like an SPV to allow for um, the pipeline uh, into the IBC process to be streamlined while recapitalization can be done more efficiently. This is not uh, the, you know, the kind of uh, a bad bank many people have in mind. But again, as I said, um, you know, it's a matter of obviously splitting hairs here about what you mean by a bad bank. But nevertheless, as I said, the details of this will be announced shortly by uh, the uh, finance minister and it's her prerogative. So um, we only have a couple more minutes. So I just want to end with some of the most um, asked questions in the Q&A, which is uh, broadly speaking, asking whether India um, can catch up to China, whether in manufacturing or in terms of double digit growth. So I just want to give you the floor for um, the last couple of minutes to talk about what you think are the most important reforms that will allow India to uh, sustain a double digit growth rate for um, several years. And thank so, you again. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously for the last, uh, you know, as you know, the um, GDP growth rate for next year will be in double digits, but okay, that one may not count because it's on a low base. Um, uh, but I think we will see fairly high growth rates even going out and we have com committed to that from the budget. Uh, we will drive growth for at least the next three years through uh, uh, spending on uh, capital expenditure. Uh, we can see also simultaneously um, a big revival coming through from private sector and from foreign investors. So I think you will see a sharp revival even in, in, in private sector uh, investment coming through. So what you're going to witness here in the next couple of years is a shift of India 
to a much more investment driven growth model um something that i had i had been advocating in recent years we've been reading the economic surveys you will see we keep advocating a shifting india to a, a, a an investment driven growth model that's what we are attempting here um what reforms do we need well uh, i have too little time to list them out but broadly speaking uh, the thrust should be clear um while the the public sector will provide um the initial stimulus we do expect the the private sector to come back in it ultimately it's private innovation private risk taking um that drives long term growth and yes international competitiveness is an important part of this story um this we are not in any way um uh, going back to uh, protectionism of the 1950s kind so with that uh, let me stop um thank you mr shanna this was um, this was this was a great uh, opportunity for our audience to um to get a behind the curtains view of uh, what the finance ministry is thinking about growth prospects for india this is um, a great chat thanks i'll hand thank it back you. over to our hosts thank you mr sanyal for such a insightful session and professor gupta for moderating it it was a privilege to host you both at the conference now uh, i'll uh, pass on to my colleague uh, nishant who will give the concluding remarks thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for being a part of the 16th edition and hopefully the only virtual edition of the india business conference it has been a great honor to host everyone virtually today at new york and at columbia business school even though we are hosting the network and conference today in new york the event has been truly global crossing regional boundaries and time zones we are thankful to the panelists and keynote speakers who joined us to share their insights on structural policy reforms their experiences on creating businesses and their learnings from leading institutions in times of crisis we think the discussions over the last two days have amply demonstrated that india has laid the foundations both on the policy and the business sides to realize the true potential of its human capital over this new decade before we bring this event to a close i really want to thank the india business conference board for their immense contribution in forging partnerships bringing together a distinguished group of individuals and spending late nights in building the online version of this conference ladies and gentlemen please join me in taking a moment to appreciate the board by giving them a round of applause i also want to thank our partners at jerome chazen institute of global business columbia global center in mumbai the north american association of indian students who have helped us in reaching out and promoting the event lastly it would be remiss if i did not mention the support of columbia alumni who who have been a great partners of columbia business school and south asia business association it's been great to host suman sena mukul gulati and arjun sagal for the conference finally to the audience thank you for being a part of the conference asking insightful questions and remaining engaged with the panelists over a weekend we will hopefully see you next year in new york city in the 17th edition of the conference thank you and stay safe